Anthropologists study people all around the world to learn about their culture, what makes us unique, and what we have in common. But how do we go about interpreting the meaning or significance of actions and symbols in the past? In this lecture, we'll learn about the practice of ethnographic analogy. As you all call from earlier in the semester, archaeology is but one of four disciplines in anthropology. Sociocultural anthropology is another, and it involves the study of living peoples all around the world, as well as within the United States. Its primary focus is the study of culture and how cultures develop and change over time. Now, culture is learned, meaning it is non-biological, it's shared, so we have similar actions or habits that take place within a, within a culture. It is symbolic, so if you think about a national flag or what a crucifix represents to people who belong to those nations or religions, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. And cultures are also integrated systems. Cultures also tend to dictate how we think and act, so people perceive and organize their world in different ways, and what anthropologists seek to understand is this complex interrelationship between culture, language, and thought. Now, our cultural knowledge exists at two levels of consciousness. Explicit culture is part of what we know, a level of knowledge people can communicate about with relative ease, whereas a large portion of cultural knowledge remains tacit or outside our, our awareness. For example, consider the concept of personal space and how someone with a different definition of it can make you uncomfortable without you realizing exactly why. That's a cool thing, right? That we can't always understand things we do or why. The key to the concept of culture is that it is non-biological. In other words, it doesn't require genetic modification through evolution, and this separates humans from other species in an incredibly meaningful way. So sociocultural anthropologists study culture in order to get a better idea of how he humans interact with and view their world. The research conducted by culture anthropologists takes the form of what we call ethnography, or the systematic study of people and cultures through which we seek to understand the knowledge and systems of meaning within them. The goals of ethnography include understanding a single culture within a specific context, and or identifying cross-cultural principles among human societies. But what about studying the past? Well, archaeologists use a method called ethnographic analogy to understand the processes that created the archaeological record by studying modern case studies or those of the ethnographic present. To accomplish this, we adapted the principle of uniformitarianism from geology, which asserts that the processes now operating to modify the Earth's surface are the same processes that operated throughout geological time. Archaeologists recover the physical remains of past human behavior, and like geologists, they must look to the contemporary world for hypotheses that account for the formation and deposition of those physical remains. In other words, observing the contemporary world provides the information necessary to infer past human behavior and natural processes from archaeological observations. This method can also be used to help us investigate the accuracy of historical accounts by looking for direct evidence of certain behaviors within the archaeological record. Such an analogy notes the similarities between two cases and infers from that similarity that other attributes of one case might also be true of the other. If an analogy withstands rigorous testing, then it eventually becomes middle range or middle level theory. For example, let's say we are attempting to interpret a mortuary feature from an archaeological context, and we've identified a future funerary ritual from an ethnographic context that shares several traits with the material remains recovered in the mortuary feature, that is, traits A through C in this figure. We can therefore assume that any additional traits of the ethnographic context, such as D, also apply to the archaeological context. This is especially useful when it comes to interpreting the meaning or symbolism of how someone is placed in a burial or the grave goods with which they are interred. Analogies, however, must be used with caution because they are likely, there are likely many differences between the two contexts as well. One way to solve this problem is to estimate the relative strength of the analogy. By increasing the number of formal similarities between an ethnographic and archaeological case, we increase the probability that the formal analogy is correct. Still, we don't know if an analogy that relies on 10 attributes is twice as good as one with only 5. Even the best analogy is no more than a probability, and there's always a chance that we're wrong. It comes down to a goodness of fit between the two cases being compared. 
relying on an ethnographic case that is culturally related to the archaeological one, improves the analogy. But what if recent events have caused cultural discontinuity between the past and present? Or what if an archaeological case lacks a clear ethnographic referent? These are complications that must be overcome in developing an ethnographic analogy. The methodology I've been describing is what we call ethnoarchaeology because it involves the study of contemporary peoples to determine how human behavior is translated into the archaeological record. By studying living societies and the material remains of different behaviors or actions within their systemic or behavioral context, which you'll recall from the lecture on formation processes, we can begin to build links between human behavior and what we observe in the archaeological record. In this sense, ethnoarchaeology is a powerful tool for creating middle-level theory. Uh, this is especially true when the analogy focuses on aspects of ethnographic data that are archaeologically observable, and it attempts to explain why a relationship between behavior and archaeologically observable remains should necessarily hold true. There are two types of analogy that have been defined by Ellis and Wiley as formal and relational. Formal analogies rely on similarities of form between the archaeological and ethnographic cases, regardless of whether the analogies come from the same culture. For example, we can infer the function of stone projectile points because they are similar in form to those found on spears and arrows in many ethnographic accounts. The more ethnographic cases that demonstrate the pattern and or the number of attributes the two cases share help to strengthen the analogy. Relational analogies entail formal similarities among societies with similar settlement systems, economies, or environments, or when the ethnographic society is a descendant community of the archaeological case. This is something that we call the direct historical approach. This latter situation is ideal, but not always possible, given the disruptions caused by contact with Western societies. Relational analogies must also rely on natural relationships, that is, the causal linkages between attributes of a thing and the inference being made. Such analogies are considered middle-level theory, which is a special kind of analogy because it is a theory that helps us get at the why of an observation and improve our interpretation. Now, your reading for this week provides an example of how ethnographic analogies are developed and applied, so let's review it together. It focuses on Pueblo ceremonial structures called kivas that are usually round but may also be square or rectangular and semi-subterranean. These structures appear in early Pueblo sites and perhaps even in the earlier pre-80-700 pithouse villages. They have a consistent set of features, including a central fireplace, a ventilator shaft that helps to bring fresh air down into the ground, a deflector stone that allowed and air to enter without it putting out the fire, and a small pit opposite the, the ventilator shaft. Kivas in modern Hopi communities also are also sub semi-subterranean and are accessed by ladder through a roof entry. They also share other features with the kivas that have been documented archaeologically. Among the Hopi, kivas are considered to be sipapus which is a Hopi word that loosely translates to a place of emergence. The original Sapapu is, a is the place where the Hopi are said to have emerged into this world from the underworld. Sipapus are also small pits or small holes in the kivas through which communication with the supernatural world takes place. Therefore, we can assume that the small pits and archeological kivas are also Sipapus and represent the place where ancient peoples say they emerged from the previous underworld. And it's also where natural, the natural and supernatural worlds can communicate. However, it's important to note that there are some differences between Hopi and archaeological kivas. So what this example is showing us of the kivas is both formal and relational analogies because there are formal similarities between the archaeological and contemporary Hopi kivas, and modern Hopi culture is, related, is clearly related to ancient Pueblo culture. We can call this, therefore, a middle-level theory because it's a theory that answers the why questions. This explains why a necessary relationship exists between an object's or a feature's attributes and the inference being made from those attributes. Now, your textbook goes on to discuss middle-level theories within the realm of what we call taphonomy. And taphonomy is traditionally the study of how natural processes become part of the fossil record. But within archaeology, 
It's the study of how natural processes produce patterning in archaeological data. So for example, Diane Gifford Gonzalez here um, studied the decomposition of large animal carcasses on the African savanna to help her understand how animal remains decompose within archaeological sites. You can start asking questions, you know, how long does it take a carcass to disarticulate, so to fall apart? Which bones tend to separate off the body first? And which ones are likely to be carried away by carnivores? And how far can we, can we observe that scatter taking place? In this case, it's easier to infer natural processes from artifacts and ecofacts than it is to infer human behavior because natural processes are mechanical. But the sort of data that archaeologists are interested then in finding are observations on the objects that will help us to seek patterns in our data. But first, we have to remove the patterns that we know resulted from natural processes. Knowing how a site is formed is critical to understanding not just the human behavior that took place, but the environmental context of that behavior. So one of your activities for this module then is to investigate and learn more about the bison bone bed at the site of Hudson Meng in northwest Nebraska. It dates to about 9,500 years BP. Um, if you're not familiar with the bone bed, it's what you're seeing in the photo behind this slide. Um, these are archaeological or paleontological sites consisting of the remains of a large number of animals, often of the same species, and often representing a single moment in time, such as a mass kill or mass death. So what I want you to do for this activity is step through the questions as I've outlined them in the activity submission, and it will help you to grasp a better understanding of analogies, middle-level theories, how they differ, how they kind of build upon each other, and yeah, you'll be building your own ethnographic analogy.